Hi, everybody. How are you? I think this is the busiest briefing room I've seen since maybe secretary was here or day one on the job. So uh, it's nice to see you all today. A uh, couple things I want to start with. Oh, and by the way, we have some students in the back. That's why. You're all from Miami of Ohio. Got it. You're journalism students? Some of you are. Okay, well, uh, welcome. We're thrilled to have you here, and you should talk to some of these uh, folks before you head out of the room. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks for the time. Uh, I'd like to start out with um, some news that has come out of Greece uh, today. And I'd like to say that we want to condemn the release of a convicted terrorist. His name is Dimitrios Kofodinas. Uh, he was released on a two-day furlough from a Greek prison. He's a convicted terrorist. He's responsible for killing uh, 11 civilians, uh, some British, U.S., and also Tur Turkish embassy staff who had worked for the United States and obviously uh, the U.K. and uh, Turkey. They released him on a two-day furlough. They did that just three months ago as well. We fundamentally believe that convicted terrorists do not deserve a vacation from prison. Our embassy in Athens has conveyed our serious concerns about the decision to the Greek government. Uh, next, I'd like to mention something taking place in Uzbekistan. The United States government welcomes the release of a journalist and activist named Dumurad Sadov. He was sentenced in 2009 for 12 years for bribery and other criminal charges, but he's always maintained his innocence. We recognize that the president of Uzbekistan for releasing dozens of prisoners of conscience since assuming the presidency in September of 2016 and for taking important steps to reform the rule of law in Uzbekistan. Support for the rule of law remains a core element of U.S. foreign policy and a cornerstone of any democracy. I'd also like to mention that our Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for South and Central Asia, Alice Wells, traveled to Uzbekistan last week. She met with senior government officials to review progress that was made under the President's reform agenda, including on issues of human rights, fundamental freedoms, as well as security and economic cooperation. And this, too, was one of the matters that they discussed. Uh, next, in Turkey, where we'd like to say the United States is deeply concerned by the February 8th conviction without credible evidence of U.S. citizen Serkan Golja for being a member of a terror organization. We will continue to follow his case closely, along with those of other U.S. citizens whose ongoing prosecution under the state of emergency raises serious concerns about respect for judicial independence, protections enshrined in the Turkish Constitution, including an individual's right to a fair trial, the safety of U.S. citizens traveling to or residing in Turkey remains a concern. Uh, he was arrested, by the way, back in July of 2017. He's a NASA scientist, if that helps you to remember his case. We'd like to call on the Turkish government to end the protracted state of emergency, to release those detained arbitrarily under emergency authorities, and to safeguard the rule of law consistent with Turkey's own domestic and international obligations and commitments. Uh, finally, uh, Secretary Tillerson today hosted the Chinese State Counselor Yang Jichur here at the State Department for a bilateral meeting, which was followed by a lunch in the James Madison room that's upstairs on the eighth floor. They agreed on the importance of continuing a constructive and productive relationship aimed at cooperation on mutual challenges and addressing our differences forthrightly. During the meeting, both sides reaffirmed President Trump and President Xi's commitment to keep up pressure on North Korea's illegal nuclear weapons and missile programs. They discussed the need to achieve a fair and reciprocal bilateral economic relationship and shared approaches to stemming the flow of deadly narcotics. Secretary Tillerson and the State Counselor look forward to continuing discussions on these and other topics at the next Diplomatic and Security Dialogue during the first half of 2018, and we were happy to welcome that delegation after their 13-hour flight when they just arrived to Washington uh, from Beijing. Uh, Josh, I'd be happy to start with your question. Great. Thanks, Heather. Uh, let's start with Syria. Okay. Uh, so, um, as you said many times before, you know, the, our U.S. mission in, in Syria is to uh, defeat the Islamic State group and prevent their uh, reemergence, but uh, overnight, U.S. Uh, forces killed uh, about a hundred people, none of whom were IS. So, um, you know, how does how does the U.S. maintain that our our mission really has not expanded beyond the Islamic State? Well, the State Department can't confirm exactly uh, who was uh, killed in that mission, but we can say we don't hesitate. And the military has been clear in stating this, and they put out a press release, I believe it was earlier today or last night, to this effect, saying that. Um, we will use force if our troops are threatened, and that was clearly the case. Beyond that, I'd have to refer you to DOD for the uh, details of that. Um, and 
how effective, I mean, you, you've put a lot of credence in the past in this deconfliction channel with mm -hmm. Russia as, you know, our, our primary mechanism to really try to prevent clashes, you know, along that line. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how effectively would you say that the deconfliction line seems to be working well, these that, days? That would also be in uh, Department of Defense's lane. What this essentially is is a, a phone line where the U.S. military and also the Russian military can pick up the phone and have conversations about where one another's forces are. Um, that deconfliction channel continues to uh, serve its purpose. It's considered a professional exchange between our two militaries, but beyond that, you'd have to talk to DOD. It's still in effect. So, so. It, 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 I just want to understand something. You're saying uh, that your forces were threatened. Which forces, first of all? You say our forces were threatened. Which forces are they? As you well know, uh, we have coalition forces there, and we also work with the Syrian Democratic Forces, and I won't go beyond that. Okay. Now, uh, to my understanding, and, and in fact, if we go back a week or two and so on. U.S. The, forces have been threatened. Right? Yeah. Not you're, you're saying that we, or, or. My understanding, and, and again, this would have to go right. over to DOD, but my understanding is U.S. forces right. working with the, with so the SDF. Like, you know, uh, maybe, you know, trainers or uh, training personnel. I, I, I'm not things. going to comment okay. on the work or the activities or the mission of U.S. forces over but, there. You know, walk us through this, you know, like, it's quite confusing because a couple of weeks ago, the SDF actually called on the Syrian forces to protect them. So there's some sort of an alliance between these two forces. And the Syrians are saying our forces, or those affiliated with us, mm -hmm. were actually attacking ISIS. So Walker, explain this to us, if you can. Said, I think I'd have to refer you to Department of Defense. They have a, I believe it's an on-camera briefing at, about at this hour right now, so I'd have to refer you to them. Uh, let me see if I can have Okay, then, then we're going to have, one, one then we're gonna have to one, move on. One, one, yes, absolutely. Right one last question. Your counterpart, uh, Maria Zakharova in Moscow, uh, basically said that you, uh, or the United States, is intent on dividing Syria and keeping the conflict going. Do you have any response to that? Uh, the United States is there to defeat ISIS. I think everybody knows. Everybody knows the horror yeah. that that country has been through. The United States is there yeah. to defeat ISIS for no other purpose. We are there also to stabilize the country so that the country hopefully can get through the Geneva process and to have elections and decide what they want to do with its future. We've been clear about that all along. There is no other reason that the United States is going to be there. And you're uh, committed to, our, the, to the unity of Syria. We have said that. We have said that all along. Yes, uh, Arshad, I think you had a question about no. Syria. Okay. Okay. Syria? Um, in the past um, and most recently, the State Department has termed um, its collaboration with Russia and Syria as a test, um, and you know. It was talked about pretty optimistically not that long ago. So given these recent events in other areas, would you say that that test has failed? I wouldn't say that the test has failed, Michelle. What I would say, it's, it's a very complicated, complex relationship, and the Secretary has been very clear about where our relationship currently stands. You, you may recall last year, he said that the relationship was at a low point. Uh, we would like to rebuild that relationship because we have a lot of areas of mutual concern. DPRK is one of them. They have signed on to four successive UN Security Council unanimous resolutions. We need more help from Russia on the matter of North Korea and denuclearization. That is one area. Another area where we manage to work together right now successfully is in that, um, in that zone in southwestern Syria, and that's where a ceasefire has held since July of last year. So we have those areas where we can work together, but we have a lot of areas of serious concern with that country, and I think we've covered that pretty well. Thanks. Okay, anything else on Syria? Syria. On Syria. Okay, yeah. hey, Barbara. Uh, just to see, Heather, if you have anything at all on this New York Times report that the SDF has picked up these two British ISIS guys, that they were members of the Beatles group, you know, the one that Jihadi John was heading. Uh. Apparently, the uh, SDF has them detained. Do you have anything on that? I just saw that report as I was coming out to the briefing room. I'm afraid I don't have anything for you on that, but that would probably be something that DOD could best address. Okay, hi. Uh, you issued an, a statement saying the, the attacks on civilians must stop, mm -hmm. but what if they don't? Because I think Michelle was asking on Tuesday if it, the, your previous statements were a final uh, warning. and. It wasn't because there's a new warning. So, are you going to issue warnings every day, every week? I, I think until? I'm I'm not going to get ahead of any actions that we may or may not take. Some of those would be determined 
uh, in an interagency process, and it wouldn't just be the State Department weighing into that. This is something that we watch very carefully. It is something that Secretary Tillerson is engaged in every single day along with his counterparts at some of the other uh, U.S. government agencies. Uh, the Secretary recently talked about this, and let me just underscore and highlight some of the important things that we would like to see uh, take place with regard to Russia as it pertains to Syria. They need to stop using chemical weapons. Syria does. But we also know that uh, chemical weapons use is enabled by Russia. They need to uh, support a new mandate uh, like the JIM, the JIM, which has been foiled multiple times at the UN Security Council. Secretary Tillerson, and we talked about this the other day, uh, took part in the Paris signing of a new uh, entity that's been set up by the French with, uh, I believe it's 25 other governments who uh, care about having an investigative mechanism put in place so that we can prevent the use of chemical weapons against civilians. Let me remind you, six times in the last 30 days, some form of chemical weapons have been used on the Syrian people. It's disgusting, it's horrific, and it's evil. And we would like to see that stop. But we'll keep following this. We'll keep working on it. The government is meeting. I have to assure you that this is a top issue for us. A anything else on Syria? Okay. Point on yeah. that, um, you know, Despite all of these statements about the use of chemical weapons, these attacks do continue. And Secretary Tillerson, yesterday on the flight um, to Kingston, Jamaica, I don't remember which leg it was, um, said that there's little the that trip, the U.S. Right? can do yeah. um, to to affect change, to change Russia's behavior. Is that a concession that the U.S. doesn't have the leverage that it needs to affect change? The United States doesn't give up. We just flat out don't give up. As American people, we don't give up. We stand up. We do what's right. We fight on behalf of people who are being humiliated, people who are being terrorized. That is why we are in Syria. We are there to help the people, we will continue to put pressure on the Russian government to do the right thing, but it's not the United States alone. Let me remind you, there are uh, 73, 74, I forget, uh, members of the de-ISIS coalition who care just as much as we do about these activities. So it's not the United States alone. Okay? So would Let's, you say that the U.S. has a responsibility to protect civilians, a humanitarian responsibility I, in Syria? I, we have called for numerous ceasefires. We'd like to see a U.N. ceasefire take place uh, in Syria right now to be able to get humanitarian aid into the civilians who, who d deserve it and who desperately need it. We've been clear about that all along. Okay, let's move on to Iraq. You want to talk about Iraq? Yeah. Okay. About, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't I jump several, to conclusions I have several there. several questions. We'll <laughs> on, on the Iraqi Reconstruction Conference yes. next week, would you send out a, a message, a note about There'll be both government and private sector there, as, as you suggested. And how will the government money from governments that will go to UN agencies? Is that correct? Okay. Uh, well, this is something that's being put on by the government of Iraq, Kuwait, and also the World Bank. Secretary Tillerson will be traveling to Kuwait. Uh, next week sometime to participate in this. He's leading the U.S. delegation. Uh, my understanding is that about 2,300 members of the private sector will also be joining, in which they'll talk about ways that they can help facilitate the large-scale reconstruction taking place in Iraq. Our policy posture has changed uh, since previous administrations. Remember, we used to be in the whole nation building. Uh, the United States government is not doing that any longer. We are providing basic stabilization. We've talked about this, turning the lights back on, providing clean water, getting the basics set up. But ultimately, we see that it's best for the countries and best for the region, too, and U.S. taxpayers to have other people participate in the reconstruction, large-scale reconstruction of these countries. Uh, in uh, Up at the U.N. in New York back in September, there was a uh, ministerial meeting of like-minded countries for the coalition to defeat ISIS. And one of the things many other nations there were talking about is the importance and how they wanted to participate in the rebuilding of some of these countries, specifically Iraq. So I think that's the direction that the overall region is, is heading in right now. Will you, be, will you, the U.S. government, be making a, announcing a contribution at this time? I'm not aware of any uh, announcements that we will be making. I can tell you overall, uh, over the past few years, we have spent, the United States government has $1.7 billion in humanitarian aid in Iraq alone, $190 million on stabilization efforts, $112 million just to clear IEDs, and of course, 
uh, there's the blood, sweat, and tears that our brave men and women have put into protecting Iraq. A final question on this. I understand that you are pu you're, you're, uh, pushing for Baghdad to allow Kurdish representation in this conference. Is there? Have, how does that stand now? Is there any news? I, I'm not, I don't have any details on that, but I think the Iraqi government would be in charge of its own delegation and exactly who, who participates and who attends. I, I'm going to have to cut the briefing short today. I just want to make you all aware I should have announced that up front. Um, <laughs> Lori, did you just gasp? Uh, Abdul, sorry I didn't get to you the other day. Go right ahead. In the run-up to the presidential election in March, the Egyptian government continues to uh, uh, hold several journalists without trial, including my Al Jazeera colleague, uh, Mohammed Hussein. Are you having any kind of conversation with the Egyptians about fresh freedom in their country in the run-up to the election? Yeah. Uh, first, let me say I, I didn't realize that it was one of your colleagues. I know that overall press freedoms in Egypt is a major concern to many journalists and people who uh, believe in free speech and who want that. Uh, last week or the week before, I was briefing over at the Foreign Press Center, and another Egyptian uh, journalist had asked me about uh, the overall situation there. It's something that we're watching very carefully. We're concerned about reports that Egypt's prosecutor general had launched an investigation into some opposition figures, so I want to, you know, wrap that into this overall discussion. Uh, in terms of any updates on your colleague, I don't have anything for you on that. I can say overall that as a part of our U.S. government discussions with Egy Egyptian officials, we have these types of conversations, not only about election freedoms and allowing opposition parties and opposition figures to take part in elections, but also having a free, fair, and open press. That's something we consistently bring up. And uh, as a, a follow-up, in terms of uh, uh, Ahmed uh, Shafiq uh, pulling out of the running, in terms of Sami Hanan being uh, detained as a, a candidate in the election, and so on, what are your expectations of the election process and how it should be? I, I think what the answer to that would be what we say in many other countries. We want for other countries to have a free and fair electoral process in which all people can participate in the election. Free and fair is something that's important. Uh, as I said, we're concerned about reports that Egypt's prosecutor general launched an investigation into opposition figures, and I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Just okay. one more, I promise. Okay, but I've, well, I, I want to get to a couple I, other people here before I, I have promise. to head just, up, and we haven't even last. talked about Asia. Okay, just a, a last one. Okay. So many Egyptians listening to you will say the U.S. is meddling in the internal politics of Egypt. Do you respect that logic? Look, now you're asking you're asking to have it both ways. Now, <laughs> you want to hear our concern about press freedoms mm -hmm. and about free and fair elections, but then on the other hand, you say you're meddling. The United States doesn't meddle. We share our concerns and we have diplomatic conversations with many nations around the world, and that's fair to say. And those countries, likewise, have conversations with us about concerns that they may have about U.S. foreign policy or, in some instances, even domestic events. Okay? Uh, let's, let's go on over to Asia. Michelle, sorry I didn't get to these folks in the back. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. A quick one. First, um, recently, Secretary Tillerson labeled China as a new inferior power. He criticized China's trade practice in Latin America. I wonder if his criticism uh, in this on trade issue came up during today's meeting. Yeah. Uh, some of our meetings with uh, countries uh, we consider to be very private conversations. Uh, some of those relationships with certain countries, we have better conversations and we work better together when we keep some of those things private. And China would be one of those countries. I can say, you know, we have a constructive relationship with China. We have a frank exchange of ideas and information and our viewpoints. Our president has made it very clear his concerns about trade imbalances. That's the kind of thing that comes up. Uh, we have a lot of conversations about those. When you talk about the cooperation, on the other hand, in the national security strategy, the United States labeled China as strategic competitor, and in the State of the Union, China was rivalry, and now the new word, new imperial power. So how do you define your relationship with China? Is it getting more and more negative? We have a broad relationship with China. We have areas of cooperation. Obviously, where we agree on the issue of North Korea and the importance of denuclearization. 
Uh, on that matter, we expect, we hope that China will do more because we know that they can do more in terms of adhering to UN Security Council resolutions and sanctions uh, that have been put in place against uh, North Korea. We're not seeking an adversarial relationship with the government of China. Uh, we are simply identifying actions that China has taken that undermine a rules-based order. Our conversations are deep and broad. They can in addition to including tra uh, trade and issues of national security, also includes cyber issues, uh, also including human rights, uh, democracy is something that often comes up, and uh, freedom of the press is something that comes up as well. Okay. Um, hey, Cindy, how are you? Good, thank you. Um, yesterday, Secretary Tillerson said the U.S. is not going to be lulled in by the North Korean charm offensive, mm -hmm. marching with the South Koreans together at the Olympics. Um, would the U.S. be open to a diplomatic breakthrough between North and South Korea? And are there any concerns about a possible clash between the U.S. and South Korea on this? Uh, uh, let me go back and remind folks that we have a, an incredibly strong uh, ally relationship with not only the Republic of Korea, but also Japan. These are ironclad relationships. You saw um, the vice president's meetings that he had uh, with uh, President Moon. They were terrific, strong, productive meetings. We are on the same page. Do we sometimes approach things differently from a different mindset? Well, absolutely, of course we do. Think about the proximity of South Korea to North Korea. Think about what that country has been through. Think about the story that happened back in 1988 when a, uh, a plane was exploded and South Koreans died. It is no wonder that its citizens would be naturally concerned about the threat that is right at their doorstep. The United States will not back away from its ally and no one is going to drive a wedge between the United States and the Republic of Korea and the United States and, uh, and also Japan. Uh, the Vice President uh, spoke very eloquently about his meetings that he had. Uh, my colleague, Mark Knapper, our Charge d'Affaires, who is based in Seoul at our embassy there, he was in the meeting with the Vice President. Uh, if I can, I'd like to just provide you all a little bit of a readout, a note that we received um, from uh, Mark. Bear with me one second. Let me find out in this big old book. <clears throat> he describes it as, as this. And again, he was in the meeting with the, with the vice president. It was a good meeting. It was extremely open and warm. Both sides emphasized our rock-solid alliance and enduring friendship while stressing our shared commitment to pursuing North Korea's denuclearization through the ongoing pressure campaign. We hope that the North-South progress will yield progress to do to denuke while, under, while there is the underlying need for strong deterrence posture and a continued vigilance. We have high hopes and support for a successful Olympics. So I think that shows the strength of our relationship, uh, the strength of our agreements, that we share uh, the uh, value and the desire to have a denuclearized Korean Peninsula. Okay. Uh, I've got time for one more question on Asia and then I gotta head upstairs. Um, oh, hold on. Okay. okay. Uh, wait, Jenny, hold on. I'm going to shop right ahead. Quickly, um, now that South Korea is apparently actively trying to broker some kind of meeting between U.S. and North Korea officials, is that something that the State Department would welcome? Yeah. Um, so I don't want to get ahead of the Vice President. Um, my job is not to make news while the Vice President is traveling in the region. That's part of it. Um, you know, I can help facilitate some conversations about that. But uh, let me highlight some of the things that he said uh, about a potential meeting or, or, or whatever you want to call it. He said, we have not requested a meeting in North Korea, but if I have any contact with them in any context over the next two days, my message will be the same as it is here today. North Korea needs to once and for all abandon its nuclear and ballistic missile ambitions and the pressure will continue on them economically and diplomatically until that is accomplished. The time has come for North Korea to abandon its nuclear and ballistic missile ambitions, set aside its long pattern of deception and provocation, and then, only then, can we begin to move forward to a peaceable outcome on the peninsula. Okay. Words like that that he's now said repeatedly while he's on this trip, yeah. how, how does that encourage the North Koreans to maybe want to um, move in the direction of diplomacy? I think, Michelle, what we're focused on right now is having a successful Olympics. We are excited to have our athletes bring home the gold. Uh, we got some hats in the back with uh, promoting the Olympics. They were trying to get me to wear a hat today. I said no. Um, so at any, in any event, Michelle, in all seriousness, 
Uh, we are looking forward to a successful Olympics. The fact that North and South were talking about the Olympics and they are participating under one flag is something that people might expect two countries, uh, neighboring countries, to perhaps do together. But I'm not going to get away in, a, away in any of that. Uh, last question, I have to go to uh, Janice. Nice. North Korean uh, Kim Jong Un's sister Kim Yo Jong will come to Seoul tomorrow. Use uh, Kim Jong Un's own airplane. Mm -hmm. As you know, that uh, uh, Kim Yo Jong's name on the U.S. sanctions list mm -hmm. is it exceptional or? How did you? Oh, it, yes. Here's what I can say about that: that the United States and the Republic of Korea are closely coordinating and having conversations about all of this. The uh, sanctions that you're referring to, we are confident that the Republic of Korea is working in conjunction with the United Nations to handle whatever waivers might be necessary for that. We are not going to get involved in that. We would leave that to the Republic of Korea. But there are Korea. too many uh, exceptionals, uh, you know, uh, to do. I, I, I'm, not gonna I'm not going to comment on that. Okay. Thanks, everybody. We've got we've got to we've got to we've got to wrap it up because I have to get upstairs for something. That's we'll we'll get it next time. Okay. Thanks, everybody.